call the meeting to order. Hello, everyone. Hope oh, everyone is doing well. Nice to see you virtually. Um, so for our consent agenda, we don't have any policies, just the previous minutes. If someone, um, if we have any discussion or questions or comments, otherwise, if someone would like to make a motion to accept the previous minutes. I'll make that motion. Thanks, Lisa. I'll do that by roll, Emily. Hi. Thanks. Uh, John. Hi. Jean Marie. Hi. Lisa. Hi. Kat. Hi. And Aaron. Hi. Super. Morgan, so you said no um, visitors other than Emily. Uh, welcome, Emily. And you're going to speak during Lenny's um, school spotlight. So no one else, Morgan? Nobody else. And okay. I don't see Christy on yet. Okay. Well, we can, um, we can start with Lenny when we get to that. Does anyone have a need to shift around the, um, the order of tonight's meeting for any reason? The only shifts I will propose, are, I have two executive session topics, so I'll, I'll just propose when we get to those that we maybe put them at the end. Absolutely. Yep. That sounds, uh, that sounds good. We'll punt those to the end. Perfect. Okay. So with no visitors um, to recognize right now, we can move on to Lenny's school spotlight. And Christy is also connecting now. Okay. Good to know. Well, I'll still start with Lenny, if that's okay with him. Yeah. Um, so for my school spotlight, I asked Emily Grimms to come and present around our new preschool playground. I thought it would be appropriate to have her present. I think she presented to, she reminded me that she did present to the board X number of months, if not longer ago, about this plan and vision to fundraise and get some matching grants to help build a, a dedicated preschool playground. And she did a whole bunch of Tyler's efforts and organization and I was smart. I'd like to think I was smart to simply let her take the lead on it and just support her. I use that old delegation rule of thumb and leadership and she's been an awesome asset to the school in a lot of ways, but particularly around how she organized this and got this all from start to end. And I thought since we've officially installed it over April break, that'd be appropriate at this board meeting for Emily to kind of present about what it looks like and maybe a little bit of how we got there. So I'm gonna kind of pass it off to Emily and let her run the show. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, I haven't spoken to a lot of people outside of my own house in a really long time. So if I'm choppy, uh, bear with me. But I made some slides so that I can walk through the the process of, of how this all works. So let's see if I can share the screen. Um, and if something, if my video isn't working well, let me know our, our internet here is a little wobbly sometimes. Um, there we go. Everybody can see that? Yep. Great. So this is what the um, draft plan looked like. And I'm just gonna walk through how we came, how the whole project timeline worked and some of the details around how we funded it, what it costs, because I think that those things are great to share with this group of decision makers in case other people need um, the information down the road. That's what I'm gonna walk through. So how it all got started was our fantastic preschool teacher, Karen Carpenter, approached the PTO asking if we would help find some equipment, just some small pieces of equipment for her preschoolers. Um, anybody that knows Berkshire knows that um, it's a big wide open playground. Um, and some of the equipment is not appropriate for kids that are under five. Um, so she wanted to try to find some imaginative play equipment and some motor, motor skills equipment. So we approached uh, Principal Badeau, who was wonderfully supportive from the beginning. Um, in Jan this was way back in October of 2018. So this has been going on for a long time. Um, we figured out the site uh, was gonna be behind the school so that it was easy access for the preschoolers. Um, 
And at this point, we still imagine that it might be just a couple small pieces of equipment from Home Depot or wherever. We didn't know where equipment even came from. Um, so it was in May of 2019 that we made some local connections that were a really big deal for the project. Um, I had noticed online that a friend was involved in the Fairfield Center School Playground project. And I asked her about it. She is somebody that runs uh, the nonprofit Grady School in Goodness, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, she knew the person that was coordinating that project and she introduced me to him. Uh, his name is Valdemar Garibay, and he spent an hour the first time we met explaining the whole process to me about how playgrounds get funded and built. Um, he told me about the state grant that I'm going to talk about, which awards matching funds of up to $25,000. Um, and he helped me connect with the playground company that we use, which was Pet and Alley Associates, and they're out of room. So once we started to figure out that um, it could be a much bigger uh, playground than we had at first imagined, um, we started to really try to raise money in earnest. So um, in July of that year, we did a big mailing to local businesses. Um, in August, Brady's Golden Business came through with a very big donation and doubled our funds that year. Um, and it was in September of 2019 that we decided to delay on the grant for a year, which is a really hard decision. Um, I don't like to wait. I'm kind of an impatient person. And uh, I didn't, it made much more sense to wait and try to build up more money so that we could have the playground that we had imagined. Um, so I tried to be a little more patient and we moved forward. And that was when I shared uh, the plan with the school board at that point. So in uh, November of 2019, which feels like an eternity ago. Um, and then that January, uh, things moved along and we applied for a RISE VT Amplified grant, which we uh, were awarded $1,500 to help pay for the equipment. Um, in January, we also recruited more help. So we got in contact with preschool parents. And that was really critical because it, um, the PTO was saving people for a lot of years. And it was uh, really wonderful to get some people in who just had some new energy and some new ideas and they were excited about the project. Um, we had just enough time to meet maybe twice with this new group of people before COVID shut everything down. So we could still do some coin drop jars and we did a bake sale at town meeting day, but we had other plans um, for some events at the end of the year and obviously nothing that we planned panned out. Um, but we marched along and in August of 2020, we submitted for the recreational facilities grant um, and we were awarded in uh, to my delight and relief in October. So that really meant that we could move forward with the project that we planned. Um, in November of that year, the site logistics were finalized. Uh, Principal Bedell met with uh, thanks Superintendent Coda and the playground installers and equipment providers and, and Mr. McAllister, our wonderful custodian, and they worked everything out. Uh, and this past April, it was all installed. Um, so this is a picture of the first day the preschoolers were able to be out and playing on. Um, and it's exactly what the first slide showed. It, our plan, we had enough money to make that, all of those pieces of equipment happen. Um, so these are some other pictures from that first day. Um, so I wanted to give you the idea of how it all worked. And then I was going to go into some of the details. Because I think that it's important to share that. I think um, until you've done one of these projects, I think it's hard to know what these details are. Um, so first of all, what did it cost? So the equipment itself was $25,000. Um, the freight to get it here from Missouri was $2,200. We chose to pay for full installation, which was $7,500. Um, we could have opted to do a community build, um, which would have been less money, but still uh, supervised by the organization. And as a group, we just decided that full installation made sense for us. Um, we got the mulch locally for another under $1,800. So the total cost came in at just under $37,000. Um, the one piece that I will say is we had originally envisioned a fence which is um, required by the state for preschool 
playground area. That was one of the pieces that had to get cut for um, COVID. We didn't have, we had a plan to raise another $2,000 through different events and it didn't happen. So I think that's in the planning process for hopefully the next several months. So um, one question that might come up is why would we make such a big investment in this playground for such a small group of our students? Um, but we looked at it in two ways. One was uh, overall, there's just a lack of play and safe motor equipment for the preschoolers on the main playground. Um, but the other factor was that Berkshire is really the center of town activities. So the rec fields are adjacent to the school. There's no library. There's no other community meeting place. It's where people go to meet. Um, so we felt like one, the one playground served more than one goal. It's open to the public outside of school hours and during the summer. So we felt like it was worthwhile for all of the Berkshire community um, school age kids to have this opportunity for play. So big question, how do we pay for it? So Berkshire PTO had some funds saved up and they provided $6,000. Brady's Golden Goodness was very generous to us with another $5,000. Uh, the Berkshire Rec Committee came in with $1,000, and then all of the other businesses, individuals, and nonprofits that came together was just over $5,000. The bake sale did very well, and the coin drop. So totally, what we raised locally was $17,900. And then we added to that the two grants. So because the RISE VT grant was considered state funds, we couldn't include that in our matching funds. So we so uh, 17,500 which would have covered about half of the um, total project cost. And we submitted that for this um, building community grant. Um, so the total funding that we ended up with was $36,900. So I just wanted to say a little piece about the grant because it's such a large chunk of money to a small school. Um, it's administered by the Vermont Department of Buildings and General Services. It provides up to $25,000 in matching funds per project. Um, they have $200,000 available to be awarded and $415,000 worth of projects were, were submitted for requests. So uh, our playground project was the third largest award that year. Uh, and it was one of about half of those that were awarded that received a full, um, a full award. So a lot of times, a lot of um, organizations submit and they'll get a third or a half, or they'll get a smaller amount. So I was really excited that, that Berkshire basically got a full award. Uh, the grant was awarded based on our ability to demonstrate that we could engage a wide variety of people in the community, that we could serve um, a, a group that was not being served right now. Um, we also needed to show that the project was shovel ready. So they want the grant wants to be the last funding source. And so that as soon as you get the money, you can start the project. Um, another big piece was showing community support and involvement. Um, and I think that that was a really big piece in Berkshire's favor. Um, we had a lot of support, both from the school side and the community side going on. Uh, this is a list of our larger donors. Um, and it spans across uh, Franklin County, which was really wonderful to see that, that we were supported from a lot of different places. Um, and a lot of local organizations as well. So I just wanted to touch on the community support piece. Um, obviously, the PTO president and one of those fundraising activities. Um, and we also had uh, three community members who wrote letters for the grant. So John, who's on the call today, um, wrote a great letter for that. Um, a preschool parent named Caitlin Wells wrote another one. And a Berkshire Planning Commission, uh, Walter Elander wrote another letter. So we had letters from different organizations throughout Berkshire supporting this project, which I think did make a big difference. Um, and obviously the school parents and community because they support the PTO events. And we also had some parents show up with a tractor and spread mulch at the end. So you know, from the beginning to the end, this was a really well-supported project. Um, the school support that we had, um, I mean, it couldn't have happened without without both pieces, I think. Uh, so uh, Principal Badeau, uh, I appreciate very much, and I was gonna thank you for the fact that you approved it and gave support when it was needed and then stayed out of the way. 
So thank you for that. Um, he, he offered site management. He made sure that you know, the I were dotted and the T's were crossed, but really let us um, bring him information when we needed something and then um, let the decisions be made by, um, by mostly by the PTO, which is great. Uh, I want to thank Morgan, who gave me some really great advice about the grant um, and provided paperwork at a moment's notice, despite being um, swamped with COVID issues at the time. So I really appreciate that. Um, our school secretary, Brandy Johnson, supported a thousand little details. Uh, Caroline Elander, who I think is taking notes tonight. Um, she's our IT specialist at Berkshire. Um, she was a proofreader for anything, anything that I wrote. She read it before it went out. So um, couldn't have done that without her. Mrs. Larrabee, our librarian, she proofread the entire grant before it went in. Um, and of course, Lyndon McAllister is our head custodian at Berkshire. And he managed the installation logistics, calling big safe, you know, helping them load equipment, um, anything we needed in that realm. He um, before I touch on the grant opportunities, I just want to say one more, one more thing about school and community support. I think it's unique in Berkshire that we have such a connection between the school and the PTO and even the recreation community because everything does center around the school. Um, and I appreciate very much how the respect ran both ways that the PTO trusted the administration um, to honor their strategic ideas and the um, administration trusted the PTO to, um, and the PTO trusted the administration to, to go both ways. The, the respect really went both ways to make this happen. Um, I just wanted to point out one more time the two relevant grant opportunities. So um, the first is the one that we used was the Recreational Facilities Grant Program. Um, and it provides competitive grants to municipalities and nonprofits for recreational opportunities that can demonstrate community support. Um, the second one that I just wanted to touch on is also administered by the same organization within the state but it's human services and educational. Um, so it can go towards the development of educational opportunities. So I just wanted to highlight those in case um, anybody had some projects in mind that they might need some funding for. Um, and as I wrap this up, I realized that I never actually explained who I am. So I'll take a step back and I'll say that I, know, I think I know a lot of you um, just because I have uh, kids that go to Berkshire normally. Uh, we're homeschooling this year and they're really looking forward to going back next year. Um, but I have a first grader and a fourth grader. Uh, I'm also a speech language pathologist and I had the pleasure of working in a, a lot of the different NMD schools since 2014. I've been contracting in different ways and uh, had the pleasure to get to know a lot of the staff and administration. So that's who I am and this is what we did for this great project. And I'm so proud to be part of the Berkshire community. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Emily, I just want to say thank you so much. You've put together a really professional presentation, and it sounds like you were professional from day one and went right through this. Um, I, I'm very impressed with what Berkshire parents can get together and, and do with the community as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Emily, I appreciate you sharing about the community involvement and support for this project. That's something that doesn't surprise me at all about the community of Berkshire. It, it's just, it's interesting to, to see this evolve with the next generation of parents in the Berkshire community. So it's very exciting to see that that level of community engagement continues. So great work. I'm excited to go see this playground now. We almost went to it today, but the rain kept us away. But I think this is amazing too, Emily. And also now we have a roadmap for, you know, the next time somebody needs something. So this is awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. And that's why I was excited to share it um, because I didn't know anything about it before this started. And I'm, I'm very open to, um, to helping, you know, I got a lot of help to do this and I would love to help anybody else who's interested. So. Feel free to reach out through. Emily, would you mind sharing your slideshow with us so that if there are other, I have principals that work on the other side, the other district, and I would love to make sure that they know about the grant resources as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'll mail that to you. Thank you. And Emily, um, I think, is it Christy that I connected you with? Because Christy had some questions about playground funding and playground um, builders. And when Christy asked you that, just going back to what I said at the beginning, Christy, Christy asked me and I was like, I don't know anything, but I do know that Emily knows everything. So I'm going to put you in contact with her to get more info on the process. Emily got a hold of me and gave me all her information. And I appreciate that very much. Awesome. Yeah, so we're, we're very, very happy and fortunate to have this bill. And like I said before, we're really fortunate to have Emily take the lead on it. Um, it was a lot of emails back and forth between Emily and I. And a lot of times it was her asking a million good questions and me saying yes to a lot of things or finding somebody else who could answer it. And it, it was funny hearing her go through the process because I forgot how long ago it started. And I remember one of the first things we did was, you know, we, we had a much smaller, we had a big vision for it. And then our vision had to get a lot smaller when we started thinking about funding. And then our vision got to get bigger again when we realized we could actually afford all the pieces we wanted when we used the match funding process. So it was really great to see that we got like the full dream. And I am talking with Lyndon, Lyndon McAllister, who's working on exploring and getting quotes for fences. And then once we get some quotes, we'll start exploring how we can fund that so we can get the fence put in as well. Lenny, I have a question about the fence. Is Are we um, at any liability without the fence? Um, no. It, so the fence is a requirement when it comes to, it's a requirement in the sense of one of the things you get um, scored on and Lynn might be able to speak better when, when the, I forget which department oversees the, the preschool kids. Sorry, I'm a little tired at this point of the day, but there's, there's basically some, some, when you, when they review the preschool program, there's a lot of different kind of boxes that they have to check off and us not having a fence at this point is not a full safety liability issue, but it's definitely not meeting the full compliance goals. So it's not like a must do, but it's definitely a preferred to do. And it's definitely a goal for us to have that to finish the process. Okay, thank you. Because I know a um, private daycare uh, a preschool operator um, could not open without a fence. Right. So thank you. Yep. So Lenny, you might be tired, but you got it exactly right. It's an agency of human services. And I think one of the reasons why Berkshire hasn't needed it the way some of the child cares have, Lisa, it has to do with the distance from the road as well. So even though they, they had a really small little section of the big playground, um, they only had a little tiny portion of fence by the road in that past inspection, but they would mark it every year as you should have a fence around that part. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emily. I'm really happy for you and the Berkshire School and community. It's really wonderful. And it's a great example of the power of collaboration and patience. So I'm happy to see that manifest. Thanks. Um, so Christy, you are up. Lenny, that was the entirety, right? You have anything else you wanna share? You're good. Okay. Um, Christy, you're up with the Sheldon School Spotlight. Um, I, I realized just the other day that um, there was a little bit of a missed opportunity here for me because uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month and I could have done something. Um, our art teacher uh, helps produce something called a stall, the Sheldon Stall Street Journal which is student writing that is displayed in the bathroom stalls. So it's in all of our bathrooms on the wall, you know, so you can read it while you're in there. And this month is all about mental health awareness. And, um, and so I'm, I'm bummed because I could have shared that with you. And so I will probably send it to you at another time, just with a little update, because I think it's pretty impressive and, um, you know, speaks to the power really of student um, voice around mental health awareness. So I, I'm gonna just share that with you at some other point, but I do wanna talk a little bit about writing. So if I can share my screen, I will do that. Okay. So every year about this time I get, um, or a little bit before now, 
before break usually, I get a manila folder uh, filled with grade two student writing. And it is letters from Lisa Chaffee's class um, trying to persuade me to do something. And it could be, you know, anything. Um, four years ago, it was to install soda machines in the building, um, to which I said a big fat now. Um, and then uh, two years ago, it was to, they wanted a um, cotton candy machine. And one of their reasons was because Mrs. Chaffee gets a little cranky in the afternoon and wouldn't a snack be nice for her? Um, and so this year, the one of the big themes was um, longer recess. So I, so, you know, we will get to that. But I was looking at opinion and persuasion in our writing, and I really only got to grades one through four, um, only because I ran out of time, to be, to be honest, right? I have fifth through eighth grade examples, but I didn't have time to uh, put them to bed together for you all. Uh, so that'll be another time. So opinion, right? Because we have two different kinds of writing here, opinion and persuasion. And so, you know, kids have lots of opinions. So here's one. This is a second grader. Um, and and her, her um, piece of writing was about the difference between, or which was better, to live in the country or to live in the city? which just makes me chuckle a little because I wonder how many of them have, you know, what, what kind of city they've been to, right? So in the country, it's quiet, but in the city, it's really, really, really loud. And if you live in the country, you have a big backyard. The student also goes on to talk about the fact that you can um, have lots of animals. Oops. Oh, why am I not? Oh, there we go. Um, in this classroom, they have lots of um, graphic organizers and help uh, doing their writing. Um, so this is a checklist. Um, so for the opinion, I used a persuasive sentence starter. Um, I have reasons, I have examples, right? So they check off as they're doing their writing. So it helps them organize their thinking, make sure they have everything. Another one, um, dear Malia, so a classmate, hi. Everyone would agree that it is better in the country. Living in the country, you can park your car in the driveway, so you don't need a taxi to get home. They also have um, some tools that they can look at. There's a, a class anchor chart, um, but some of the kids do a little bit better when they have that at their desks. Um, so Natalie Bruzy takes what's on their anchor chart and reproduces it in a handout for them. So this has persuasive words and transition words. So you see a lot of, a lot of those words in their writing as they're learning. This is grade four, right? So here's an example of an introduction in opinion writing. Warm summers, cool winters, and nice weather. What's not to like? I haven't been to California, but with all my research, it makes me want to move. It has mild weather, which makes outdoors fun all year. You can do basically anything all parts of the year, so it's rarely too hot or too cold, and rarely has bad, wet, really bad weather, which makes it more of a safe place than, let's say, Florida, aka the hurricane state. Here's an example of some evidence. Second of all, I think California's climate is amazing, which I know, hold on, my picture is in the way, which I know should be a thing in every state, but I think California does it best. The average temperature is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's fairly warm temperature in my honest opinion. And another thing to know about the mild temperature is that the sea creates the more mild, desirable weather than some landlocked state like Vermont. Moving on to winter, or should I say all year fun, you can go skiing, sledding, and snowboarding all during the summer because the mountains are being snowy all year. That's impressive. And 
and an example of a conclusion, a different student. In conclusion, no one knew that on August 3rd, 1977, a star was born. He wasn't expected to be great. He was the 199th overall pick in the sixth round in the 2000 NFL draft, but he's now number one. Tom Brady had to overcome obstacles and prove to everyone he's the greatest of all time. Our um, first graders started with a little bit of gentle persuasion as the you know, kickoff to their persuasive writing unit. And they put posters around the school. Does please help bees. And then a little bit more persuasive writing. Mrs. Martin, I think we should get a longer recess. Let me tell you why. Or, Mrs. Martin, I think Chloe, Chloe is uh, Lisa Chaffee's dog. I think Chloe the dog should come to school more. Let me tell you why. Chloe has come on Wednesday during callback. And Chloe has a little group of uh, students who read to her. The student would like her to come more often. And lastly, here's Miss Martin. My opinion is we should have a longer recess because for my first reason is we kids need fresh air to think. And, and if they don't do their work, they'll get in trouble. Yeah, no. My second reason why we get a longer recess is because we love soccer and it's really cool. My, you probably like to see kid, us playing the, that's my third reason for a longer recess. So you see, I have many reasons why we should have a longer recess. Sincerely, mm -hmm. Lincoln. Yes, please. <laughs> I had taken a couple of different videos, but um, with their masks, some of them you really couldn't understand what they were saying, so. Lincoln came up to me after and said, I was a little nervous when I was reading that. I'm sorry. It was pretty cute about it. So. Those are great examples, Christy. I always appreciate seeing the, or hearing about the thinking that our students have. And persuasive writing was always my favorite time of the year. They, they do love it. And each classroom takes a little bit of a different approach. Thanks so much, Christy. I appreciate you sharing that. I especially love the picture of help the bees. The, that was very sweet. I love it. It's good stuff. Thanks. Um, okay, anything else for um, Christy from the board? All right, so moving on, Lynn, you're up with your superintendent's report. Okay, so I'm going to jump into personnel. Some of this is going to be informational and some of this will, will require action. So we have filled some positions already and I know um, principals have been very active in the last day or two and those may not be reflected on here but we'll capture those for the June meeting. 
So for right now, I'm going to ask for the board to make a motion for hiring um, in Bakersfield, Kristen Torito for kindergarten, Alicia Hall. Uh, this is a, the Alicia Hall is a paraeducator, so that's informational. Uh, in Montgomery, they've hired Courtney Scar as the guidance counselor. She'll be sharing that position between Montgomery and Richford Elementary School. And Sheldon has hired Michaela Mativier to teach third and fourth grade. So I would ask for a motion to hire Torito, Scar, and Mativier. I'll make that motion. Thank Second. You. Thank you, T. Marie. Um, by roll, Emily. Aye. John. Aye. Jean Marie. Aye. Lisa. Aye. Kat. Aye. And Aaron. Aye. And Mary is an aye. In terms of <clears throat> resignations, we have a resignation at Bakersfield, Maura Lorraine in kindergarten, in Berkshire. Berkshire, Gabrielle Raddy in grade one, Katie O'Shea, Catherine O'Shea, middle school science in Montgomery, Cassandra Krieger who teaches four five, Emma Holcomb who teaches third, Jessica Tandy who teaches kindergarten. In Sheldon, Sarah Phillips teaches third and fourth grade. She was on a one year leave of absence this past year. And Bridget Etting Ettinger Kernan, grade three, and Kim Gravitt, middle school math. So it ask for the board to make a motion to approve those resignations. Lynn, before that motion is made, um, you didn't include Claudia Woodward on there. Is that because she's SU? It's because she's retiring and I was gonna do that in the next section. Oh, okay, yeah. she's listed She's listed here with the resignations. Okay. Yeah. I, I revised it on my copy, my apologies. Oh, no problem. So a motion, um, I'll make that motion to accept um, those resignations. Do you need me to list the names specifically again? I think Caroline, do you have my notes? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay, so that's the motion on the table um, by roll, Emily. Aye. John. Aye. Jean Marie. Aye. Lisa. Aye. Kat. Aye. And Aaron. Aye. And Mary is an aye. In terms of retirements, we did have one retirement, um, and that's the one uh, Mary just pointed to. So Claudia Woodward has decided to retire at the end of the school year. She's not an NMV employee, she's an FNESU employee. So I'll be bringing her retirement to the FNESU board for approval, but she's assigned to teach in Montgomery. So that's why I'm informing you. So that, that's just an informational piece. Uh, in terms of open positions, uh, at the time that I wrote this, I think some of these may have been filled. Like I said, in the last two days, these principals have been on fire with hiring uh, new teachers. They have been around the clock interviewing. I, I called somebody yesterday but I returned a call yesterday and they said, I'm just walking into uh, five interviews in a row. <laughs> I thought, oh, okay. I just know that that's the life of the principal this time of the year. They're, they're doing a lot of interviewing, a lot of observing lessons and a lot of hiring. So we have currently at Bakersfield Middle School Science in grade four at Berkshire uh, Middle School Science, grade one, a uh, halftime academic coach and a paraeducator. And Montgomery, a halftime academic coach. There she, she and Montgomery and Berkshire are attempting to hire together um, and split the position between the two schools. In Montgomery, there's a 0.4 FTE library position that has been advertised as a full-time position. She's sharing that position with Richford Elementary School. Kindergarten, um, grade one, grade three and pre-K. That's gonna be SU funded most likely. Um, in Sheldon, grade one, para, middle school math, um, and NMV in general, we're going to be filling a, a 0 0.5 FTE nurse position. So this is the time of the year where we start to hear um, from our employees. Some of them we know, 
Some of them we know that they've been communicating to us for a few years that they're trying to get closer to where they live. This is the time of the year where we feel that churn of the turnover with teachers. And I know it's stressful for the leaders. It's stressful for, you know, our schools in general. So some of these, you know, we, we knew were coming, some not so much, but it is, um, there's that time of the year and they're doing a really great job of trying to get these positions hired or filled with high quality candidates. So there's your update on open positions. In terms of extensions, we have, a few still out there. So as per the master agreement, staff members had to let me know by um, May 1st, whether or not they were gonna ask for an extension. So the following have been granted an extension until May 15th uh, to sign their contract. So in Bakersfield, Kendra Pillsbury, in Berkshire, Trisha McFadden, in Montgomery, Danielle Bergs for her 0.4 art, and Nicola Charity. In Sheldon, Rebecca Shoot, and Curtis Comfort. And those are the extensions. <clears throat> the next, next up is gonna be an executive session. So we'll pause on that, Mary. That's okay, we'll come back to that in the end. Absolutely. And then we have a few, um, a few leave requests. So we have some teachers who have been out on leave and the, to get to the end of the year, they're short some days. So there are some leave requests for unpaid. So we have Charlotte Farrell, um, who has been um, out on FMLA uh, since January-ish. And she is going to be short three and a half days. Um, so she's requesting that the board approve three and a half days of extended unpaid leave for Charlotte. So I, do you want me to tell you these one at a time or do you want to take them all together? Why don't we do them all together, Lynn? Okay. Yeah. So Cassie Krieger is also out on FMLA uh, from Montgomery. So she's going to be out for the remainder of the year and she's going to be short one day. So the request there is one day of unpaid leave. Kelly Hyde, um, has been out since uh, early March and she's requesting that be extended through the remainder of the year and she's going to be short 10 days so she's requesting 10 days of extended unpaid leave to get into the end to until the end of the year so three requests i'd like to make a motion to extend that leave um, as stated because this is an extraordinary year in terms of people's personal circumstances and health circumstances, I feel that this does not set a precedent for the future, but it is making an exception for an exceptional year. Great. Um, so the motion is on the table to accept those three um, extend uh, extra days of unpaid leave by roll. Emily? Aye. John? Aye. Jean Marie? Aye. Lisa? Aye. Kat? Aye. Aaron? Aye. And Mary is an aye. I don't have anything under, well, I have one more personnel, but again, that's the second executive session conversation. So we'll save that until the end. I don't have anything under student. And then in terms of pandemic response planning, we included in your board notes, a copy of the, our comprehensive needs assessment that we have completed. That's the phase one part of developing our, our recovery plan or our COVID response plan as we're choosing to call it instead. So I wondered if there were any questions about the, the comprehensive needs assessment. So we're now squarely shifted into phase two where we're looking at, you know, now that we know these are our comprehensive needs and we have been able to, this plan has to be written at the SU level so we've been able to see all of the individual schools comprehensive needs assessments. We've taken all of those comprehensive needs assessments and we've integrated those into one SU level comprehensive needs assessment. And now that being said, we're writing this next phase of the plan at the SU level, taking into consideration all of those parts. 
So we're in that place where we have multiple stakeholders taking a look and providing feedback uh, on this plan. And it is, um, it is gonna be a multi-year plan. So right now we're, we're really looking at this as not a really thoughtful detailed plan yet, but more of a, these are the big ideas because we have to be really strategic in terms of how we spread this funding out over the next three years. So we still have much work to do to be able to narrow the focus down on that. Um, and, and I do know that Emily had got to spend some time with our curriculum leader on that plan. Thank you for doing that, Emily. She gave me kind of a summary of, of your thoughts and I thought those were great additions. We've been uh, working with met the local mental health agency. We're partnering with one of the local pediatricians who's gonna take a look at our plan and provide some feedback. Um, a variety of stakeholders, our leadership team is going to be able to provide some feedback on it as we move forward. Um, we have some parents, we have board members, and, we have these opportunities that are scheduled over the next several weeks with, with different small stakeholder groups to review and provide feedback and really think about, um, help us to think creatively about how we can really utilize this money in a way. Ultimately, when I look at this money, I would love for us to be able to look back 10 years from now and say, we did a really great job of being strategic and that money has made a really lasting impact on our supervisory union, because I think that's the, that's the best gift we can give to our students and to our communities is that some, some sort of sustainable impact that will continue to um, make this a great place for our students for many years to come. So that's kind of the lens that we're, we're looking at this through. So we'll be bringing more information to the board that phase two part of the plan is due to the agency on June 1st. Um, I, I think just in terms of talking with colleagues across the state, it feels like such a heavy lift. I'm sure we will all be in a place where we could submit on June 1st. It's hard to imagine right now in this moment that we'll be ready because it, there's just so much work left to do, but that's really, that's where we are with the plan. So we'll give you some more information as we get to that June um, timeline. Lynn, I just had one question. What is a BESS or BESS screener? I think the BESS screener was, um, it's a social emotional screening tool that was administered to students where they answered questions and it really assesses, you know, how they're internalizing, what kind of um, social emotional needs they're demonstrating based on how they're answering those questions. Okay, so it's like a written survey of some kind. I didn't admit, I wasn't a part of the administration, so I think it was actually online. Is that, okay. Rhoda, was it online? Yeah. Yes, it was. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? The next piece is really just informational. I don't have a lot to say about it because I don't know a lot about it, but I know as part of the American Recovery Plan, they're looking at um, infrastructure differently. In the past, infrastructure has not included school. And uh, it appears that that may be the case in President Biden's infrastructure plan. So there's a possibility that there may be an infusion and investment in infrastructure in schools. So um, I, we are just keeping that in the back of our mind that there may be some additional funding coming for facilities projects. Um, so we're keeping our eye on that and I'll let the board know if I learn anything more about that. Lisa, is there anything that you know about that? Not to put you on the spot, but is there anything that you've heard that you could add? No, that's fine. And no, I have not heard anything along the lines of infrastructure. Although I did see in today's news with the um, unfortunate news that um, Burlington High School is going to have to vacate their property permanently. I did see something at the end of a news report that indicated that um, there may be help coming for that type of situation. So I'm not sure if that's what it's referring to is federal funds for infrastructure projects. Could be. Okay, thank you. 
So in terms of end of the year, we did receive our end of the year guidance from the Agency of Education, and, and we do have um, the ability to look at planning for the end of the year in, in a way that is more inclusive of in-person events than what we have been able to think about in the last 14 or 15 months. So I know that the principals are, are thinking forward about what opportunities will they have for the end of the year. And they're trying to get creative with, um, the, there are still some restrictions in terms of the amount of square footage that's available if they're going to do any sort of celebrations inside. And there's the other complicating factor of having to determine um, the number of vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals that would be attending those events. Uh, so we, you know, we've definitely questioned, I've questioned that at our level, how are we to determine that? And they have, um, the feedback that we've gotten is essentially you need to ask um, and, but you cannot ask for someone to provide you documentation, just ask, are you vaccinated or are you not? so that you know whether or not you count them as a vaccinated individual or unvaccinated. So that's really where we're at. Um, it would be, if we're doing counts like that, they'd be more informal um, to determine. It just feels a little, um, that part of it feels a little sticky, but we will work through it. So then I know the principals will have, um, I'm sure more information for you as we get closer to June about what their plans are for the end of the year. In terms of the legislative update, I don't have a lot. I will be completely honest that I have had not a lot of time to be following the legislative process in the last couple of weeks. I've been a little bit uh, underwater with meetings. I, I do know the one thing that has kind of come up is the, the waiting study. It does appear that that's heading off to a study committee. I believe that that's, the, that's where they've landed on that. So I don't think they're moving on that in this legislative session. It sounds like they're gonna make a recommendation for next year. Um, Lisa, anything you wanna add there? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a task force that will meet um, and come back fairly quickly with recommendations on how to implement the the waiting study because the waiting study is like three years old now or more mm -hmm. so um yeah um it appears to be moving forward in a positive direction so that at least the um at least the issue is going to be looked at and addressed now um so we'll we'll keep keep our ears open i don't believe it's gone it it isn't totally passed yet let's just put it that way but i think it's on its way to the governor hmm. i'll have to look at that it may have had to go back to the senate so the, for the the task force you're saying they're going to report back really quickly but not probably quickly enough for them to move forward with the waiting study for this next no no it won't affect um it, it won't affect the budget that we're going to be working on in the fall. It, okay. it can't happen that quickly. I didn't think so. Yeah. Okay. The only other thing I have for you is uh, annually, this is our, our second annual report of elementary school choice for the in-district transfers for NMV. So this year we have uh, one student from Berkshire who will be attending Montgomery. And we have two students from Bakersfield who will be attending Berkshire. And that's what we have for movement this year. And if there are no other questions, that concludes my report. Thanks, Lynn. So we have principal reports. They were included in the packet does anyone have um, either on any principles want to share or highlight anything from your respective reports or any board folks have questions, thoughts about the reports? Nothing? Okay. 
Um, so then moving on, Morgan, you're up with the financial report. Thanks, I sent your financial report out by email this afternoon um, through the end of April. Uh, once again, I think I've been telling you the same story since um, October, uh, anticipating that we will end the year significantly in the black, primarily because of high school tuition student counts coming in lower than budgeted. Um, so no changes to that. We may see um, bill back tuition from the prior year still um, this year. It's actually due to the field, uh, I think back in December and it hasn't come out yet, um, but that seems to be par for the course now um, with the AOE. So that may not get into this fiscal year. Uh, the only other is that um, we have seen a couple of drafts of the audit. Uh, we are going back and forth with the auditors on some uh, liabilities that they want us to bring over from Sheldon as a forming district that we don't think are ours. So um, the short story is that the audit is clean and we will get the final copy um, eventually. And we're just debating about um, a small amount of money on there that's not gonna be relevant if we win or lose really. Um, but I think we're gonna win. Can I ask uh, Morgan what liabilities those are? I don't know if you can speak to what those are. I think it has to do with a, a grant that um, that Sheldon received and didn't spend and the money for it didn't come over to us. I've kind of let Mary do so take the lead on it, but it, it has to do with, um, with a grant that they had received. Hmm. Interesting. Um, other than that, I think um, unless you have questions, that's all I have. Um, Morgan, I have one question. Um, mm -hmm. Did uh, pre-merger, um, did Berkshire come to the, uh, the merger of the new district with a capital reserve fund? Yes, Berkshire, Bakersfield, and Montgomery each had one. And could some of Berkshire's capital reserve be used for the playground, the preschool playground um, fencing? Sure, it could. Ostens needed. Ostensibly. Yeah, if we can't find um, grant money or general fund money to do that, we certainly could tap that. Okay, just a thought. Yeah. I mean, I just want to honor the immense fundraising effort and grant effort that went into the bulk of that. You know, I mean, the entirety mm -hmm. of that project and it may be good for us to keep, you know, our minds around being able to help support that last, that, you know, that last push, if sure. there aren't other funding avenues. Mm -hmm. And especially if we are in what sounds like pretty solid kind of financial shape right now, owing to some of the surplus on, uh, and savings on high school tuition. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. And that was it, Morgan. Anything else? I have. Nope. All right. You sure you don't want to fill up? Or you you have fifteen more minutes, and your time is up. Yeah, you good. <laughs> All right. Um. So, well, then let's see. Before we do board business, why don't we um do our executive session. And I think that we can then let everyone go um, other than... Um... I think I'd like to keep Sandy and Morgan for this yeah. first executive session. And then I think the rest of the principals can uh, have an early night. <laughs> Great, thank you all so much. Thanks everybody. Would you like me to record anything after the executive session? I'm not anticipating any action as a result of the executive session. Okay, sounds good. Mary, it, it, did you want her to? No, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, we'll just be, I mean, I may do a quick update on darn tough, but nothing substantive and no action. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. And you are out of executive session. Okay, super. So I'm gonna make the motion um, 
to uh, have Lynn negotiate a successor contract for Kelly Bacchus as discussed in executive session. By roll, Emily. Aye. John. Aye. Jean Marie. Aye. Lisa. Aye. Kat. Aye. And Aaron. Aye. Okay, super. Um, so let's see, so for board business, um, well, I had a very successful negotiation myself with the um, wonderful woman at Darn Tough, who was very gracious and did give us um, a 15% discount on our bulk purchase of gift cards. Um, and um, also then had to create an entire new platform to be able to do the gift cards in the amount that um, we needed them. So she was very gracious. And um, we are waiting for, um, Lynn had this wonderful idea to kind of team up with part of the gift. So we're waiting for that component of the gift that Lynn and Courtney have organized and we will be distributing those um, next week with a card of appreciation that Courtney um, really drafted beautifully and is going to print out for all the teachers and staff. So, so I'm really pleased, uh, pleased about that, how that all turned out. Thank um, you so much for your hard work. You all have done an amazing job and thank Courtney too. Oh, I will. She's really amazing. Yeah. She's, um, she wants to do that kind of thing. Yeah. She's so really? good at, she's yeah. so good at it. Yeah. She really excels in a lot of arenas, but that's certainly one of them. So it was a good, a good team effort. Um, and yeah, so that, that will, those will be going out next week. And we did send, um, Courtney sent out a, a mass email today, just letting, you know, just because this is technically the teacher appreciation week. So she sent out an email, just letting everyone know that the board, you know, so, um, how much the board appreciates everyone and that there are gifts on en route, a special thank you. Um, and we'll be kind of sorting and getting those out next week. Uh, anyone else have any board business they would like to, um, to tend to? Or anything else you want to address? I just had a question about email addresses. I think we've talked about it uh, before, but I feel like I have the longest board email address in the history. Um, so I was wondering if there's any way, um, I don't know everybody else's board email addresses, but is there an option to change it to like an FNESU email or do I have options? And can I chime in? Cause I asked Courtney for my login information the other day because I still don't use mine. So I just still use my regular one, but am I missing stuff by not using the school board one? So Mary, I'm reading your poker face. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had uh, quite a few conversations about managing multiple email accounts. So we had talked about it, it is, it is wisest for us to have our board members using for board business a board email account, but I know several of you are juggling multiple already. Lisa, I know you have several that you're already juggling. I know Jean Marie is as well. So we haven't, that hasn't been a tight expectation as of yet. We're still sending to people's email addresses that they've given to us. You all have an SU account and we can transition at any time. We can shift it to your SU account. So it should be just like the pattern uh, that we have with our SU account. So it should be this first name dot last name at fnesu.org is I believe how it was set up. Um, so we could shift and I can have Courtney send you your login information. We can change it on our um, board lists when you're ready. Okay. That um, would we great. get it at both. We currently. Okay. So it would just be like removing our personal one. She wouldn't have to log us in or anything because we should have already done that, or at least I have. I never have. 
I still have E Norris Sheldon School Board at, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that is so funky. <laughs> it's a little long. Okay, yeah, that'd be cool if I could figure that other one out. And John, do you have one? Hmm. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, I'm wondering if I, we dropped the ball on that. So I will, I'll ask Dominic to lean into that and make sure that all board members have an account with login information. Um, and I, I will duplicate. So you're getting it in personal and in the board until you tell us to remove the personal. Okay. And is that okay, Lynn, that we still get it on our personal, even though, I mean, like I, I look at my personal email all the time. Right. I don't switch over to look at my FNESU email very frequently, but it's all there. Like nothing gets deleted from it or anything. It stays there. So I have a record of everything that's come from Doreen or Courtney. I mean, ultimately it would be great if we could shift to the to the SU email accounts. I think that was our, our goal in the beginning, but I certainly, I could be convinced that that doesn't have to be something we're tight on. I feel like there's a way that you can set it up so that you're, you can like fuse the two together. So it's still sending to the board, but you see it in your personal email, but I think like you're you right. Like do a Google on that. Yeah, if D Dominic can tell us how to do that, that works. Okay, I can ask him that. Because right now I just, I have to toggle between the two. Like I don't even have a separate icon f for my um, board email because I use Gmail for my personal. So it makes me physically have to switch accounts. I can't just look at a little icon on my phone and notice that I've got three messages in my FNESU account. If I could do that, then I'd, I'd know when I had email. I think when we talk about the like automatic forwarding from one account to another, if you get into a situation where the press is requesting uh, emails from us, they might be getting your personal ones as well as the school board ones if you forward it all to your personal <laughs> account. <laughs> Wait, Wait, that's right. that's yeah, thanks, Jean Marie. All right. So, um, so it sounds like Dominic to the rescue to help sort out some of these um, email challenges. I'm not saying I'll get on board with with it, but I do think it's not a bad, to, not bad to trend in that direction. Um, That's progress, and, Mary. Yeah. <laughs> that I'm willing to consider it. Yes. Um, anything else, folks? Okay, so I just need a motion to adjourn. Um, Lynn, can uh, I stay on quickly for just a quick minute with you after? Sure. Okay. All I right, folks. Um, who made the motion, Emily? Yep. All right. So all in favor, give a little wave. Take care, folks. Have a great night. Good night. Everybody.